This is your coffee break. Hi friends, I'm back again this week and I have with me today a very special treat. I have on the line lawyer Mike Papantonio, who just published uh, his second novel, which is a sequel to his previous Law and Disorder. This one is called Law and Vengeance. It's coming out this month. I am super excited about it. Mike, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, so I have so much to ask you. Uh, first and foremost, can you just give us a little bit of a brief insight into your career and how you got into writing books? Well, I started out as a prosecutor, and from there it ended up that um, my specialty was trial law. And uh, I would typically try cases, well, I still do try cases for lawyers all over the country, everywhere from L.A. to New York, when they have a what they call a complex tort case. And so that's what I've done my entire career. We, For example, my firm initiated the tobacco litigation in America. We handle probably every major pharmaceutical case on behalf of consumers, where consumers have been, a um, uh, pharmaceutical company will put out a product that's causing some kind of illness or sometimes death, and we're mm -hmm. hired to actually do the test cases, to try the test cases on behalf of consumers. And that may range from environmental cases to pharmaceutical cases to cases against Wall Street uh, criminals. <laughs> <laughs> And so it's kind of a varied thing. We handle probably some of the most important whistleblower cases in the country. And so that's what I'm, that's what I'm steeped in. That's all I've ever done is actually tried, tried complex cases. And uh, so the, the books that, uh, that I'm turning out right now are really stories that come from true stories. I mean, actual cases that we've handled uh, mm -hmm. over the years. And of course, um, they're dressed up to make it into a more of an interesting fiction. Uh, we've, you know, <laughs> when there's a murder scene, that probably didn't happen. <laughs> but most of the scenes did happen. Most of the trial scenes actually happened. The courtroom scenes happened. Uh, the negotiation with the corporation of the day, those types of things happened. So I think, you know, people have kind of a voyeur interest in the practice of law, just like they do medicine. And I think that's and that has something to do with the success of these books. That's so fascinating. And you're absolutely right. It's just um, maybe for those of you who are in it every day, it, it becomes mundane. But for those of us on the outside, I can't get enough. So um, so all of these, all of your stories um, are, are based on true stories, um, based on your very uh, passionate law career. I, I kind of want to highlight a little bit, um, you've done a lot of work with the whistleblower cases. Can you tell us a little bit about what you kind of hope your books will accomplish? Well, most people don't, you know, there's a lot of myths out there about the practice of law, Sarah. I mean, there, the myth is that, uh, for example, um, that, you know, everybody plays fair, that corporate America is is always responsible and they always play fair and Gee whiz, poor corporate America is always uh, is always victimized by those dastardly trial lawyers. <laughs> well, the truth is just the opposite of that. And when you listen to some of the stories that we hear from whistleblowers, for example, uh, Law and Vengeance, the second book, um, is is really based on a case we actually handled, where you had a uh, manu uh, defense contractor manufactured a gun sight that was deadly be for for the user because it had the potential to be off by three degrees for every hundred yards, and uh, they knew it. I mean, the manufacturer knew it. They sold it to the government, sold it to police uh, police forces all over the country, and people were actually injured because mm -hmm. of it. And so, so this whistleblower comes forward, and, of course, the company attacks the whistleblower, victimizes the whistleblower, and um, and they, they in, in, in the way that the media handles the story, end up looking like the bad guy. And so the... You know, we had an administration come in under Obama where they made these promises, and it wasn't just the Obama administration. I mean, you can go, it, it's, 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 it's party blind. It's not a Democrat issue. It's not a Republican issue. It simply is reality that you have uh, leadership always is going to land on the side of corporate America. They're always going, where it comes to a whistleblower who wants to try to change things because uh, there's a pharmaceutical, for example, out there that's killing people, and the whistleblower comes forward. 
government regulatory is always going to land on the side of corporate America. I mean, 99.9 percent of the time. And, uh, and, and then the other part of it is the whistleblower is also victimized because the media hmm. typically lands on the side of corporate America. And I mean that in this sense. If you have a, if you have a pharmaceutical that's being produced by Bayer Corporation, uh, the media, th- that's how they make their money. They, they take ad money from Bayer Corporation. They make millions and millions of dollars from Bayer Corporation. So they... They don't tell the story. And when a whistleblower comes forward and tells the story, all that's turned on the whistleblower. So it's a very difficult road for whistleblowers in America. That's fascinating. And what you say about, you know, with the media coming from ad money, what, what about other things? Why, why do things generally land on the side of corporate America? Well, first of all, they have so much, they have so much influence. They have political access. They have influence. They have affluence. They have limitless money. Uh, when I go to trial with a corporation like Pfizer or Bayer or Dow Chemical or DuPont, uh, it's, it is always a David and Goliath setting because, mm. uh, you know, we approach, it with, um, we approach it with far less than they, have, than they have to work with. And, you know, they can pick up a telephone and call a regulatory agency and say, oh, Joe, you know, give us a break here, and, you know, maybe when you're – done with your job as a regulator will give you a job that hmm. happens every day it's called the you know it's just a, it's just a, a revolving door so they can do that they can call a congressman they can call a senator they can put money huge money behind a pr firm that is that pushes their story a great example was in the first book law and disorder the the case that i that i used uh, was actually based on a product called yaz it was a, comp- a case i handled against bear corporation just happened to be bear and it was um it was a, a birth control pill that was that was killing and crippling young women between 18 and 35 all oh the gosh time. so when we when in during that time the interesting thing about it is is i was working i, I was a, a, a political commentator for uh, MSNBC. I'd worked for uh, for Fox News as a liberal political commentator. Um, I, I I was all over the media. But when I would ask for a producer to please do this story because it's the difference, it's a life and death story, they simply couldn't do it because Bear was paying them too much money in advertising. So that story was only the only resolution was to take them to trial and and expose the story. And that story is actually used in the Law and Disorder uh, book, the first one to come out in these series. The third book that's coming out uh, the same time next year um, is on the opioid uh, hmm. saga in the U.S., the opioid catastrophe, which that's the case we're handling on behalf of cities and states all over the country. Uh, that another, another issue where the media had ample information to understand that the distributors and the manufacturers were simply dumping opioids in very small communities um, on, a, on sometimes as high as a 200 to 1 ratio. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, yeah. There was a, uh, and so, but, but to have them tell the story is very difficult because they have to run through all the red tape. It has to be uh, the same thing we faced with the tobacco case. I mean, mm-hmm. if you think back when we initiated tobacco here, my gosh, getting anybody to tell that story was impossible. So that's, that's kind of how things line up. And the advantage that I have is I, I, this is what I do every day. So I don't have to imagine these cases. These stories pretty much write themselves. Oh, my gosh. I love that you're doing this. this. You are doing wonderful and important work. And one of the things that continually fascinates me when I speak with writers is this interesting dance that you do between fact and fiction. And, and I love that you are using fiction to sort of maybe bring awareness. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you hope readers take away? And maybe if you're, if you want readers to take some kind of action because of your books? Well, I think what what readers, whether they realize it or not, they do take action, whether it's a call to action or not, once they know the facts, Mm -hmm. most people, you know, most people are, have a responsible conscience. They, they hear a story, um, this story, uh, uh, Law and Vengeance, um, is also involves one of the biggest environmental cases in the country that we handled against uh, DuPont. But when I tell the story and they hear the facts, they're outraged <laughs> because they weren't <laughs> facts that they heard from the media. Right. And so it, whether they do it overtly or not, it affects their view of the world. And, and when it affects their view of the world, 
typically that's a positive and they they may not even realize that they're t- they're they're moving that way they they hear a fact that that all of a sudden they say gee i didn't know that that's what i want to accomplish with these books i'd like people to sit down on a beach and read the book and be entertained and at the same time they come away knowing something that they didn't know before mm-hmm. knowing for example in this book i just absolutely attacked the department of justice as being totally dysfunctional and uh but but you don't hear those stories you know if you think back to the uh the obama administration you know eric holder was was considered a hero mm-hmm. um ashcroft was considered a hero under uh, george bush but when you really tell the stories they're not heroes the, you know there's more to there's more to all this why why is it for example i raise these kinds of issues in in all in, in this book in particular about the department of justice how could we allow wall street to steal eight trillion dollars from the american economy and not one of the thugs on wall street go to prison for it? How, how does that happen and so people don't you know day-to-day people are busy they don't have time <laughs> to think i mean they don't it, it's difficult to put these to connect all these dots but when you do it every day, it's just kind of, you know, it's just, it's just what you're aware of. And, and so those things, those types of issues easily manifest themselves in the, either in a, a, a dialogue between two characters or in the backstory of one of the characters. Those things are easy to build into a, easy to build into a novel. And I think that transitions nicely into the next thing I want to ask you, which is, you do so much. Um, you you are a senior partner at your law firm. You have a radio show. You are writing books. You are appearing on TV. How how did you fit writing a book into all of this? Well, you know, it it really is. Um, busy. I know you've heard this, but if you want something done, give it to a busy person. <laughs> it, really, it really has to do with you know time management when you have a window you use the window. The window might be 3 o'clock in the morning, but, uh, you know, you use that window and, and you, you say, this is, you know, I, I've got to, I've, I have to have this done in six months or seven months, and here's the time, and you, you simply, you, you plan better. Hmm. I don't think it affects my quality of life in any kind of way at all. As a matter of fact, it, I think it, it further enables a good quality of life because it keeps you, it keeps you interested in the world. It, you know, when you, it's kind of like turning a phrase and you, you come away from it and you say, wow, I really like that. <laughs> that, was a, that was really an original thought and it really was an exciting thought. And, and so I, I, I think that's the way I look at it. I've got all kinds of hobbies on top of it. So it doesn't, people ask me, gosh, doesn't all this stuff that you do stifle your life? But no, I think it allows you to still be a good parent and be a good spouse and, and be a member of the community that's, that, you know, that, that does that does some good. And I, I think all these pieces fit together. What I do on television is not much different from what I do when I write. I, mm-hmm. You know, I've got a, a weekly show called America's Lawyer that shows all of, in every English-speaking country in the world. And it's, it's, um, it just ties into what I do. It's just kind of a continuum. So it's not like I have to sit around and drink this stuff. <laughs> you know, all I have to do is pick up a complaint that I filed against Pfizer or you know some Wall Street thug, and I have the I, I've got the story right there. So it it it's kind of a it's kind of a natural transition, I guess is the best way to put it. I love it. And what a great attitude. I think a lot of the time, the things that we are able to do and the things that we allow ourselves to do comes from the attitude. And I just I love the idea of just understanding that, yeah, writing a book, yes, it makes me more busy, but it also makes my life amazingly better. So that's that's just what a great outlook. I love that. Don't you don't you love to do an interview where you come away thinking, wow, that was great. And it empowered me and it energized me. And I I, I now have these new ideas, and I, so that's the way I look at it. And, I, and, and, and you probably do too, if you sit down and think about it. If you if you said, well, gee, I'm not going to do podcasts anymore. I'm not going to do what I do day to day. You you couldn't even you couldn't even visualize that. No, yeah, it's part of who you are. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Oh, I love it. Um, so, kind of going back to your books as well. I guess, what is your favorite part about writing? You touched on this a little bit, but I kind of want to ask explicitly, just what is your favorite thing about writing? I love when all the parts come together. Yes. I love when you, you know, uh, what I do, I do I do what they call theme assortment, and, and that is where you put your themes together, and they're not always in the 
you know, you, you you don't put them exactly in the in the way that you you feel like you're going to write the book, but you you have your themes and you move these cards around, and all of a sudden, it's it's just so rewarding <laughs> when they all come together, and you go, wow, that really did fit. <laughs> and it, it's kind of like it's kind of like putting that last couple of pieces in a puzzle, you know? <laughs> yes. You know, I finally got that. I finally got that sky right. Here, here it is. Here's this piece I was looking for, and you know, in, in in a thousand pieces of blue sky, you got that one piece that fits in, and you go, "Wow, that worked." And I think that's the exciting thing. It's kind of like a game. I, I just I, love, I just love playing the game of that. I love that. I love that. That is one of the greatest joys about writing. I agree. Is that when it when it all comes together. Um, do you ever have frustrating moments when it doesn't come together? And what do you do at that point? Well, what I try to do is I try to walk away. There's a couple of things that I do um, that of try to avoid that. And that is, you know, I always I always end with a hot hand. I, I walk away when I when I feel like my writing is the very best. I say, okay, wow, mm. I could continue writing and I could close this chapter, but I'm right. It, it, it's working so well. Let me walk away right now. So when you sit back down, it's so easy to pick up that heat. You know, mm-hmm. it's so easy to pick up that that notion that you have or that concept that you're working on because it's there. And you never come back and sit down and say, oh, my God, <laughs> I've got to move on to something else now. <laughs> because it's kind of like, it's like playing an instrument, you know. You, you get a pentatonic scale, you're playing it, and all of a sudden this one little note fits in there right, and then everything comes together. So what you do is you you for me I, the the way I avoid those those traps is to say well okay I'm gonna I'm really I'm really liking what I'm writing right now but I'm gonna stand up and walk away and pick it up tomorrow. It takes an amazing amount of of willpower and self control that I want to say a lot of us don't have. <laughs> like eating Oreos. Yes. You go wow this is working right now. <laughs> I could eat another Oreo, but I'm going to stop. <laughs> so, same type of thing. I like that. Oh, gosh. Yes. So, I'm I'm also curious. So, so you write these amazing legal thrillers. Can you tell me, um, I guess in your own words, what do you think makes for a really engaging story? Well, I think you have to invest in characters. I mean, you know, we... we uh, that's kind of a litmus test to me when I'm trying to write a book is, do I like the characters? Like Gina Romano in, in Law and Vengeance. I really like the character. Yeah. I actually borrowed from, I borrowed from my sister. You know, she's kind of, this Gina Romano is kind of this tougher New Jersey uh, trial lawyer that, I, I don't know, you start writing and you put some dialogue in there and she says, you know, you have her saying something that you can visualize fits her perfectly. And when that comes together, that's that's really w- rewarding. Uh, Gina Romano, I started off with just visualizing my sister. How would my sister interact? Uh, my, you know, how how would she interact in this situation? And then I gave her a law degree, and then I put her in these horrible situations. And said, well, how would she how would she react to all this? But I thought she was an interesting character because you know she comes from this she comes from this affluent family that had everything i mean she grew up with everything of uh, you know uh, uh certainly upper upper one percent middle class i mean way beyond middle class to the one percent and grows up in a mansion but she's in this dysfunctional family i mean we hmm. when we think of when we think of abused children we sometimes we always think of the poverty stricken children which are plenty of but but Gina grew up in a home where you know Daddy was completely a nut. I mean he was a sociopath. Hmm. Mother was a drug addict, and um, so all of the bad things that come with that she grew up with, and basically ended up having to raise her brother in this story. So uh, you know, so that was that was fun to build that character because I think the character is so is so important in a book. If you can't invest into that character, I, I don't know. It's just to me, if you read a book and you can't really, you don't feel like I'm pulling for this one because, then I think it leaves you a little bit cold. I would agree with that about a million percent, which I know is not a real number, but that is how much I agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah, if I don't connect with a character, then no matter how good the story is, I put the book down. So Yeah. Yeah. yeah, why 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 do you want them to win? Because you like them, you know? There's something about them that you like. 
Yeah. So I think that's an important part of it. I love that. Does Does your sister know that you base this character on her? Well, unfortunately, she passed away. Oh so, my gosh! Uh, I'm so sorry. So, yeah. Well, that's that's that's. Uh, but it was, you know, you you sometimes you sometimes run into these people and they're just such an enigma. You know, mm. you go, well, let me let me make some notes about this, and and then all of a sudden one note leads to another, and you've created this, you know, really vibrant character. I'll, Gina Romano will be a uh, well, she'll she'll certainly appear in in some of the other the other law what I call the law series, like Law and Disorder is the first, Law and Vengeance is the second. Uh, law and addiction is the third, and then uh, law and terror is the fourth. Uh, that's uh, that's a book about a case we're handling where we're finding that the, uh, the some of the biggest banks in the world you you, you know are washing money for terrorism. Oh my god! And they they actually have uh, they've actually pled to it. You had nine banks in Europe plead guilty to washing money for terrorist activity, and so we're actually handling the case against those banks. And so there, that's another real event where we're taking a real event and making, you know, I'm making it into a, into a fiction book. Man, I admire that you're doing this so, so, so much. Well, I guess they, thank you for writing these books. Um, I kind of, I kind of want to ask um, if people are interested in picking up your books. So you have um, Law and Disorder, Law and Vengeance, and then you have two more coming up in the series. Um, where can they find them? Where can they find you online? Yeah, uh, Mike Papantonio is, is. If you Google Mike Papantonio, you'll come up with, with a lot, a lot of a lot of hits. In different <laughs> areas, but you'll certainly come up in the area of books. But uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all the you know the major bookstores have carried Law and Disorder, and they they'll also be carrying Law and Vengeance. But I always tell people, you know, Amazon is such a great. It's just such a great system, and. It, Especially for a writer, I like Amazon only because. But but, but Barnes and Nobles is you know they've been very good, good to carry to carry the books that I write. Um, but I think um, you know they're going to be able to find them in most places. Um, just another. I don't. I again. I want to be very respectful of your time. I just have uh, sort of one final question for you, and that is. If you could give an aspiring writer, so sort of the ideal listener to this show, if you could give them one piece of writing advice, what would it be? Find somebody that has done this and has done it several times and, uh, <laughs> and it can act as, as kind of a, a, a guide, a mentor of, hmm. of, of, you know, that also, you know, is good. But I've had very, I've been very fortunate to have good editors. And that's a big part of it. You know, I'll sit down with an editor and, and, and say, this is, this is what I'm doing here, you know. And they'll say, well, have you thought about this? And, you know, you might get into a hole this way. And You've got to interact with somebody who's done it. I, I, I just, somebody just sitting in a room and saying, I'm going to write a book, it happens, you know. And, but I think it's the exception. I don't think, um, I think an association uh, with somebody who's really, had the experience he's willing to help you know so many writers there's you know they're, they're 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 in their own world and they don't have the type of willingness to sit down and help a young a young writer but i think you, you get more out of that even than you do going to seminars and things like that i don't know that you come away with with anything real impactful if you're going to a seminar with 100 people in mm -hmm. there i think it means a lot more when you can find somebody they may not even live in your town, you know. It's worth a drive sometime to go meet them and say, you know, I'm really interested in doing this. But, but isn't that the first, you know, in order to get there, you have to say, I'm going to do some unusual things. Mm. Because writing a book is not a, is not a usual, <laughs> not usual thing. So to do that, you're going to say, I'm going to have to do some unusual things. I'm going to have to make some unusual effort to meet some people who've done this that can help me. And I, I really don't think I, you know, it would have, it, I, I guess I could have, but it would have been much more difficult without having people uh, that I've surrounded myself that can, you know, that much better writers than I am that have helped me come along as a writer, I think. That is wonderful, wonderful advice. And it's so true. And it's especially what you say about attending writing seminars. It is so much more beneficial to a writer to have that relationship with a mentor. So I just, oh my gosh, I couldn't agree with you more. Mike, 
This has been such a delight. Thank you so much for... Well, thank um, you. I appreciate <laughs> you taking the time to do this. Uh, I, I, I hope somebody listens and, and, and uh, that, we, that our conversation has benefited somebody. Oh, I, I absolutely know it will. I absolutely know it will. Um, so yes, uh, go out and purchase all of Mike's books, um, which will be the second one, um, Law and Vengeance, will be available September 26, 2017. Um, I'll have links to all of that good stuff in the show notes for today's episode, including Mike's uh, website, lawanddisorderbook.com. Mike, you're you're wonderful. You're doing great work, and I'm so honored that I got to speak with you today. So well, thank I you. I, get to, I hope I hope I get to talk to you about uh, every book that I that I turn out. Yes, please come back again. Yes, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. <laughs>